only the gods see everything. This is the No Fear Podcast. We know what scares you. I'm Matt. I'm Mel. And I'm Lisa. And this is the No Fear Cast, the podcast where we dissect horror and all the things that scare us. This is season four, episode 15. And after dipping our toes into Roger Corman's post cycle with House of Usher, we decided to take a deeper dive into Corman's contributions to horror with a focus on his 1963 movie, X. So listeners, if you've been listening for the past month or so, you know that we ended up doing a kind of a series on Poe. So we talked a bit about the most, well, recent, came out last sep the, uh, September, October, His Hideous Heart, uh, which was a collection of kind of revisionings of Poe stories and the more contemporary, I would say, settings and characters. Um, and then uh, we talked a bit about the House of Usher, and we had two mini episodes where we talked about the 1928 silent Usher film, and we talked about an animated version of the Telltale Heart. So as we were going through all this, we kept thinking about Roger Corman's Poe cycle. And if you've been listening to us for a while, you know that one of Lisa's favorite uh, classic horror movies is X. Uh, which was a movie that came out in 1963 and later became X, the man with X-ray eyes. So we decided to do, to go back and do one of our type of uh, master of horror episodes, which we haven't done in a while on Roger Corman, talk a bit about his career and kind of focus our discussion on X. So I'll give, I guess, just a little bit of background about Roger Corman, though I'm sure our listeners have heard of him before, or at least watch a few of his movies. Um, he was born in 1926, I believe. I know he's 93 this year. He is still alive and he is still producing movies uh, with his production company. So he is definitely, I don't even know how many hundreds of movies at this point he directed and or produced. But in the 50s in particular, uh, he would do sometimes, he would direct 10 films in a year. And I believe he was, it was in the late 60s when he told someone that he had already directed over 100 films. So he was extremely prolific. And he did this through uh, basically trying to use as small budget as he could. He's actually said in more recent years that he feels like huge movie budgets are kind of obscene and that the movie could, the money could be used for other things. Um, and he also would try to go kind of as fast as he could. So sometimes he would use kind of those guerrilla filmmaker techniques, you know, not getting permits, just trying to get the shots. Um, at one point he was making movies. I think he made Little Shop of Horrors in two days. Sometimes it would be as many as seven days. I believe Usher was kind of an outlier because it was three weeks that he worked on that movie. And he also has been what people call the Corman School. He's also worked with a lot of people who then became kind of stars in film in their own right. So he kind of gave a start to some directors like Francis Ford Coppola, Ron Howard, Martin Scorsese, Jonathan Demme, John Sayles. Uh, he also worked with actors like Peter Fonda, Jack Nicholson, Dennis Hopper, uh, Bruce Dern. Uh, so he worked with a lot of people who then went on to be in other kinds of movies. And his career kind of developed from starting out as a director and then after doing creature features and getting into the post cycle in the 50s and 60s he started kind of realizing i guess uh the way the winds were blowing and the counterculture and he ended up doing a few films that kind of i guess got the vibe or the zeitgeist of the 60s so the wild angels which was his movie uh, in 1963 about the Hell's Angels motorcycle gang. And then I believe he produced The Trip in 1967 with Peter Fonda. And then um, he started out working on Easy Rider in 1969, which was another kind of biker movie. Um, then in the 60s and the 70s, he started doing a bit more production and he was known for exploitation films. So women in prison, uh, that sort of movie. But he also around this time in the 70s and the 80s was finding um, foreign films 
uh, by directors like Fellini and Bergman and Kurosawa and bringing them to America and distributing them into American theaters, which I thought was was very interesting that he was doing that as well. And then his career kind of uh, morphed into just production, just producing movies pretty much. And so I think in the documentary that I watched, Corman's World, which I highly recommend for people who are interested in Roger Corman's career, um, they're following him while he's working on a, a sci-fi channel movie. Um, so you get to see a little of the behind the scenes with that. So that is kind of a, I guess, a snapshot of his career. I forgot to say in 2010, he got the Academy's Lifetime Achievement Award, which I think is an important kind of moment to mention as well. But I want to kind of start to segue us a little bit into X, and we can obviously talk about some of his career and his life as we talk about the movie. Um, Lisa, I know in past episodes, you have said that X is like, you just love that movie. I know you're really excited when we were talking about what movie we could focus on for this and decided on X. Would you like to tell us a little bit about what you particularly enjoy about X or why it's a really memorable film for you? I'm going to try very hard to talk intelligently about this, but I just want to squeal because, <laughs> because I love this movie so much. Um, okay, so a little bit about X. So first of all, you mentioned it was a 1963 movie produced and directed by the wonderful Roger uh, Corman. It was written by Robert Dillon and Ray Russell. And we've talked about Ray Russell before on this podcast. I think we did a Master of Horror on him. We haven't, but I think we should. Well, then we we need to. to, (laughs) I know we've (laughs) talked about, we've talked about Ray Russell a little bit. I think his name has come up, but uh, Ray Russell is another favorite of mine. And so obviously having Corman and Russell working on the same thing, just absolutely it's like somebody made a movie for me. <laughs> but so you have this movie and basically what it's about, if I'm going to condense it, is it's, it's about a, a an optometrist who is working on, it, it's the basic idea. So, you know, we have a bunch of movies recently that were, or recently, maybe within the past 10 to 15 years that were kind of obsessed with like, oh, people are only using 10% of their brain. And so we need to tap into the other 90% so that we can make these superhumans. And this was kind of a similar idea in that I think it opens saying that people only use about or only can see about 10% of the wavelength of light and color and, and all that. And this doctor is obsessed with wanting to know what can happen when you access the other 90%. And there's all sorts of wonderful like dialogue, like warnings in the very beginning, which I love. Um, He's testing things on monkeys and the monkeys, it doesn't go so well with them. Uh, um, But there's all sorts of ominous warnings. Like you only get one set of eyes or only the gods see everything. Uh, So you know that it's not going to end well. And then the doctor decides, well, I'm going to experiment on myself because who else would you experiment on? And everybody warns him against it, but he decides to put the eye drops into his eyes to see if he can see more. If he can, yeah, basically if he could just see more wavelength, more color, the idea is he hopes, and it's quite noble, but of course it doesn't end as nobly as it begins, but he 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 wants to be able to better diagnose his patients. So he wants to be able to look at at a patient who's ill, and maybe the X ray isn't showing enough, and he can look into their body and say, "This is what's going on." So he has very good intentions, and and I think this is one of the reasons I love this movie so much is because. Number one, it is it is a good horror movie. It's a good sci-fi horror movie mashup. Um, it's got really creepy parts. But if you look at the specific type of horror it is, it's this cosmic horror. Uh, it, it's almost Lovecraftian in the way it ends because really quickly after uh, Dr. Xavier puts the drops in his eyes, he realizes that it... it he can't always control it. So at first it's, he can just look into somebody's body 
and see what's wrong with them. And that's all well and good, but he finds he can't stop it. And it slowly starts driving him crazy. Like he talks about at one point living in the city and living in like a skyscraper type building and being able to kind of look up and down and see all the people above and below him. And just that feeling of how it drives him crazy and kind of drives him mad. It's like a hellish landscape for him being in the city. Um, so he eventually has to run away. There's also a murder, but we'll, <laughs> we'll get to that point at some point. But one of the other reasons I love this, besides being just really good cosmic horror and sci-fi horror b- blend, is I think this movie stands out from the other like 50s and 60s sci-fi horror movies in that it has such Shakespearean sensibilities because throughout there are these grandiose ideas of hubris and greed and of course you see the hubris in the doctor and he wants to see everything he can and there's this idea that humans maybe shouldn't be able to see everything in the universe because our minds are not prepared for that and that that's that's the cosmic car that kind of comes into play but then also when he later runs away after I mentioned the murder he accidentally sort of accidentally (laughs) kills one of his colleagues who tries to get in the way he like throws him out of a window and then he goes on the run because he he's like oh gosh people are gonna blame me for this this guy's death and he becomes a faith healer uh he's basically working as like a side with a sideshow carnival barker who by the way is played um very well I think by Don Rickles and this guy is like the epitome of greed because he essentially wants to enslave Dr. Xavier once he realizes that his powers are real and that he can actually use them to see things that other people can't see and he turns them into this kind of sideshow faith healer and you see these like poor and elderly people lining up to get a diagnosis. It's really kind of heartbreaking, but the, the, um, when you see the immense greed, when, when people realize that they can monetize this kind of x-ray power, it, it takes on a whole different level. I think anyway, I just, I love this movie and I don't know if I, if I'm describing it in any way that makes sense to people who haven't seen it. If you haven't seen it, by the way, I would suggest just hitting pause and going and watching it because you could find it out there. Um, I think it's on Amazon prime right now. And I would, I would definitely highly recommend it, but um, I love this movie. It was independently made by the way, Mel, you mentioned that Corman often made very low budget films. This one was made for under $300,000 was actually um, picked up as a double feature with Francis Ford Coppola's dementia 13. So that's how it was first released in 1963, which I'm so jealous of those audiences that got to sit through both those movies as like a Saturday double feature. But anyway, that's another tale. Um, I'm really curious to hear what you guys thought of the movie. Have y'all seen it before? I had seen it, but it has been a very, very long time. Yeah, I, I, I love it. I don't think I love it with quite the uh, intensity <laughs> that you seem to have for it. <laughs> but it's definitely a fun movie. Uh, I, I I love that idea that that goes throughout it of of that that forbidden knowledge sort of thing and and like you said that that hubris that he thinks that it's perfectly fine he ignores all the warnings like the monkey that may or may not have died of shock from what it had seen or 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 even just the the warnings of friends and colleagues and that sort of thing of saying hey you need to stop this and he's like no i'm going to keep putting these drops in my eyes I, I must see more i must see more i must see more and i've always liked that idea it's been a really long time since i've seen it though so rewatching it was really fun to to do because like i had remembered parts of it but I, I didn't really remember everything you know like there's so many little things throughout it that uh that, that that i just had kind of forgotten like i had i'll be honest i had completely forgotten that don rickolds was the uh the carnival barker slash whatever the guy the guy who manipulates him into being a faith healer but but yeah i uh i i really like the movie and uh there's a i think there's a lot to be said uh, once we get really 
deep into the discussion, but I'll I'll uh, let Mel respond too. Sure. Yeah, this was my first time watching the movie, so I had like put put it on a mental list that I needed to watch this uh, because you had mentioned it before in the podcast, Lisa. And at one point, you mentioned uh, Sardonicus, which is also it's based on a Ray Russell story, and I watched that and enjoyed it. So I figured I would watch this and enjoy it, and I did. Um, the plot holds together really well. I mean, I thought he went very quickly from being involved in a malpractice suit because he, you know, cut the surgeon John Hoyt's hand so that he could try to save the girl's life to accidentally, in quotations, knocking his friend out the window. Um, but after that, uh, once he runs away from the cops because of that, uh, his kind of I don't know what the word would be, but the, the choices that he makes seem to kind of make sense to me. And I thought that the the kind of quote unquote mad scientist hubris was well done because the very beginning of the movie literally has you looking inside a bloodshot eyeball that you then see dropped in almost like a test tube type of thing. And I think not only does it catch your attention and show us that this is about eyeballs, but I think it also kind of <laughs> makes you think about your own eyes and how vulnerable they are, if that makes sense. Like I started thinking to myself when he kept putting the drops in his eyes and he didn't know what was going to happen. I was like, you know, I wouldn't want to do anything to my eyes. Like I want to be as protective of my eyes as I possibly can. And I feel like that vulnerability and like not wanting to hurt your vision is something that really, like, even when some, even when things that aren't really scary are happening, is still like really disturbing, uh, which I, which I enjoyed and appreciated. And I also like the idea of him like starting out in a noble way. And then it gradually just became like, oh, I can see women naked and, oh, now I'm going mad. And now I'm making money off of this. There was like this weird progression as you see through like all his reasons of doing it and just realize that he was doing it just to do it, to know things, to discover things. And I thought that was, that was interesting as well. Um, one more thing I'll say, and then we, I guess we should probably try to get into discussion of it is I was really, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I thought the woman in this movie, uh, I think her character name was Diane. Uh, let's see. I wrote it down. Diane Fairfax, I think. Yeah. She was Diane. a, she was a doctor in her own right. She was working for this foundation trying to help get him money for his discovery. And even though throughout the course of the movie, she's kind of tied to him because she wants to take care of him. I thought she was a very, she was a developed character in and of herself. And she often stated very logical until she told him to run away after accidentally killing the guy um, other than that, she stated very logical arguments against what he was saying, even pseudoscientific arguments. And we find out later that she has her own practice. I thought it was, I thought it was interesting that she wasn't necessarily like just his sidekick. She was actually another doctor whose expertise he seemed to kind of respect. Cause I mean, he ignored the eye doctor's expertise too. So, but up until that point, he sees her as just another scientist um, and she even says at one point that she had to give up, she gave up her own research to help other doctors like him. And so she wanted him to take her seriously. And I thought that was an interesting character um, for a movie that it was admitted was written as quickly as it was in some ways. She was a much more developed character. And the Don Rickles character was a much more developed character than I might have expected with that uh, that decade of movie. Yeah, I agree. I, I had noticed too that um, Diane's character was a really interesting character because, and, and I kept having, even though I've seen this movie <laughs> a lot, um, I kept having to remind myself that this was 63 because you would expect, of course, Diane, Dr. Diane Fairfax, um, <laughs> as she is in the movie, she she's one of those characters who she could very easily be the love interest, which I think they tried to play up a little bit that there might be kind of a love brewing between the two of them. But I, I liked that the film didn't, didn't really pursue that and instead kind of made it a, she cares about him on yes, a personal level, but also it's, it's about his research and it's about her interest in the scientific field and, I thought she was a really well done character. And and you mentioned 
the scene where he when he leaves the hospital um and he goes to the party and there's uh he, the gag is the usual gag that like oh I, I can see with x-ray eyes so i can see naked people <laughs> at the party um i i liked how because of course in a movie like this that's in the 60s and it's a sci-fi movie and he has x-ray vision like there's got to be a scene where the man sees everybody naked like that's <laughs> that that is just something that you expect and they played it but i did think they played it really well because when he mentions to her that he can see her it almost takes a predatory turn there and that's the first time you really see him as moving away from that nobility because earlier you had the surgery scene that you mentioned where he had cut the other doctor's hand. But I think as an audience, we're willing to let him cross that boundary because we think, well, he's saving the little girl on the table. And so he's just, he's going rogue, but he's just doing what he has to do to save the little girl. And so that still feels like a noble action, even though he's getting himself in, in malpractice and he's, he's obviously going to get into trouble with that he's still seen as the hero, but it's not until later at the party that he does start to take that predatory turn. And I, and I like that because I like the way the character slowly turns into a more monstrous character. And you see it even later when they actually escape to Vegas, when she runs away with him and he's like, okay, I'm, I'm going to, we're going to head to Vegas. I'm going to win us some money because I can see the cards and I can cheat. At one point, she even says to him, you know, you've got enough money, let's go. And he says, they can't stop me from winning. And it's that it's that hubris again, because it's not about the money for him. It's about the power and the control. And that was like the first glimpse you got of it when he was looking at her through her clothes. And he was like, oh, that, you know, you've got a mole. I don't know. He said something really creepy about you've got a mole on your. <laughs> it was a birthmark. On your torso. A birthmark, yeah. And I was just like, ooh. And even the look on her face is, you kind of got the sense that, okay, that's that's not okay. She immediately turns around and he makes a comment about her, her backbone. And um, yeah, I, I like the way they kind of slowly turn him into something like from the hero to the monster. Yeah, I do too. I think that's a really good point about how for him, it you... you... <laughs> Well, I don't want to just repeat what you said, but I, I really like how you said it, that uh, that it's a gradual turn. And, and it's one of those ones that, I guess, happens by inches. And so at first, we are willing to go along with him until he gets to a certain point that it's almost like, well, no, we, 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 we're not we're not following along that far you know um as far as identifying with him but i i think for me that was the scene that really kind of started it for me because like you said it he he goes from oh i can see to oh i can see and it, it's this very the actor plays it very well at, that you can kind of see that turn happening as the scene progresses if that makes sense but yeah, it, it really, uh, I, I think that that would be the, the place to point to as like where his, uh, his downfall begins, if you will. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. And I think it kind of, that theme or that idea of his hubris and almost becoming predatory or feeling like he's more powerful than everybody else is hinted at with the, you know, when the eye doctor tells him only the gods can see everything and he's like well what if we could too um no matter his noble ideas you see him kind of almost subconsciously i guess pushing that also i don't think it was very inexplicable to me in some ways why he kept putting the drops in his eyes he keeps saying that it hurts and it's cumulative effect and blah 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 but he still does it it's almost like he just wants to continue on with this experiment on himself and I do think that moment where he's talking to her about what he sees under her clothes is a very disturbing moment. And that kind of starts that downfall. But you see it too when he's a carnival barker. Like he obviously doesn't care about the people. He's just trying to make enough money 
to continue his experiments and keep and make more eye drops to put in his eyes. Even when he becomes the quote unquote faith healer, he does have some ethical issues with it, I guess, but he just kind of wants to be given money and left alone in his room to continue working on the eye drops. And it's almost like every time you start to feel for him, like when they're driving through the city and he's, you know, upset because he says the city looks unborn and he just sees this weird like wasteland post-apocalyptic scape or whatever around him. Um, he immediately is like, let's go to Vegas and get money. And I think that scene is like the epitome of his hubris because like you said, Lisa, she's like, well, we won the money, we can go on. And he, he keeps, like, he's actually yelling out to these people as if he's like a show, like they can't stop me. I can win as much money as I want. And then he just starts yelling out all the cards. He's basically showing them what he can do and taunting them and bringing the police into it. And then he ditches her and leaves her there to deal with the police while he steals the car and, and drives off into the revival that he goes to at the end. So yeah, I think that idea of like being like at the all seeing, all powerful one that's like a God is really at the heart of his whole project, even when he tries to couch it in terms of helping people as a doctor. And he just, as he goes through all these permutations of like the carnival con man, it just gets closer to maybe what he already was. Um, if that makes sense. It's, it's almost perfect that he ends up at Vegas, like stealing a bunch of money and trying to make everybody look at him because he's always wanted to be that powerful spectacle, but that's, he can't do it as a scientist. So he's going to do it uh, gambling. Well, he almost even, by the time he's working at the carnival, he kind of reminds me of, of Raskolnikov from, from crime and punishment, that idea of I am the superior man. These people are beneath me. I, I I have moved beyond them, if that makes sense, uh, to the point where he's, I mean, yes, there was the, the jerky guy who was like, you know, heckling him essentially that he demeans and like makes run out with his tail between his legs. But you can tell the that X kind of, or I guess Xavier, Dr. Xavier, <laughs> he, uh, he gets a bit of satisfaction of it. I mean, there's a bit of smugness to that too, as as he, as he calmly says, you know, just goes through everything that he knows about him from the stuff that he's able to read that's in his pockets, obviously. And uh, yeah, like like they, that's really where you start to see him thinking that he's become some sort of transcendent thing that's above human when he isn't necessarily. You know, and he he's acting like a bit of a jackass, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, that's a perfect term yeah, for they're... it, especially when he's in Vegas. <laughs> oh yes, the the Vegas. I mean, it, it's so smug, especially like I get it. Uh, I, I've I've seen plenty of other like gambling style movies. He was riding that high of winning, and especially the fact that he was untouchable. But when he gets to the point where you know they've they've got the uh, the pit boss down there who's dealing the cards and they they finally like they close down the table and he moves to another table and he's like wait nobody else bet and then you know and, and he's like now flip over your card and blah. I mean, it's he's clearly getting like this sense of satisfaction of how superior he is because of his x-ray vision also i found that a little unrealistic cuz even in the 60s they probably would have a escorted him out of the casino at that point because like they couldn't prove that he was cheating but they knew that something was up they would not have let the man keep gambling but that's uh that's just a small uh nitpick there <laughs> well they they had to have that moment so that when they called the police his glasses would fall off because that was one of the big reveals true true <laughs> well no i mean <laughs> i guess they should have called they could have worked it so that he you know, either they called the police or they they escorted him to a a very dimly lit room in the back um, for his glasses to fall off. But but yeah, uh, it was just a moving to the <laughs> it was moving to the second table and the pit boss just sort of like like eyeballing him, giving him like some side eye as he does it. And it's like, well, but isn't it your job to stop people from doing that stuff? But whatever it was just it was just a moment where i it kind of pulled me out of the movie for a second because i was like wait they wouldn't go down like that but <laughs> yeah yeah i agree they probably would not have let him just move to another table um 
but I, I do, I love that. Well, I love the, the casino scene for all the reasons we've talked about. I, I love that we really see his ego coming through and, and we see, I mean, how quickly he's willing to push um, Diane aside mm-hmm. and st- completely stop listening to her. Because if you compare that again to the earlier scenes where, like you were discussing, Mel, where he he really seems to take what she says to heart and they are more of equals. And then at that point, she's just the blonde sidekick who's easily pushed aside, um, which, of course, she comes back later in a really wonderful way, which we'll talk about as we get towards the end. Um, but I do want to talk a little bit about like the special effects in this movie, because this is one of the other things that I think this has, why this movie has such a place in my heart, because the way that it's, the way that they do reveals, I mean, in a way, I guess you could look at it as it's a little bit cheesy, <laughs> but I don't know. I also love it. I mean, I love that it, the movie opens with this disembodied eye that's just kind of a gross image to watch. <laughs> um, and then you see it floating. I love that. I love that when you see he has x-ray visions, like one of the um, one of the ways you know it's working is when he is laying in the hospital bed and you see through his eyes, because they do a lot of that camera work where you get it from his point of view. Um, and you get the sense that he's watching everything, but then all of a sudden it shows you that he's, his eyes have been bandaged the whole time. And his friend says something, Sam says something to him like, you know, Oh, you'll get the bandages off soon. And he's like, Oh, I hardly noticed. (laughs) I mean, I don't know why, but little, the little like twist and reveals or like the, when his, um, when his glasses fall off in the, in the casino and he's got these weird, like black and gold eyes, um, which become fully black by the end. Uh, I, I don't know. I just, I love the special effects in this movie. And it is very mid 1960s science fiction special effects, but I don't know. I think, I think there's something special to the way this movie was shot that I think makes it, makes it stand out. Well, I really liked the the technique of how they would have that, ring around the outside of the camera or the well i mean the screen i guess so that it really does look like you're seeing through an eye whenever they would show his perspective like that that was that was one of my favorite things about that movie yeah i yeah, I, agree I agree with both i agree with both of you on the special effect in the in the interview that i stumbled upon you know he talks about this idea of like always thinking about revisiting x and maybe like updating the special effects but i thought they worked really well i mean even the uh when he starts seeing further and further and he can see through the the ceiling and the roof and he can see past the stars and he sees a thing at the center of the universe that's watching us all the time when he's looking at the city and he sees the girders like what i thought was really cool that you saw things from his perspective but i also thought that these like just trippy kaleidoscopic almost dreamscapes that he created were really interesting i i kind of feel like it was more effective seeing those sorts of images for the audience than if we got like a computer graphic or a cgi effect today of him seeing girders inside of a building it's like that would almost seem too like superhero-ish or marvel or something whereas this was very (laughs) almost like expressionistic and surreal, which I think lends to that weird confusion of perspective that he's going through. Yeah. The, the low budget of of it. And I, and I think the inability to have the high tech adds a certain charm to it that I've often thought that I was like, I wonder if I, because obviously if somebody remade X, I would run to the theater to see it. (laughs) I mean, I would have to. But I also, I think I would never want that to happen either. Yeah, I think it stands on its own. It does, it does. But you mentioned something, and this, I I may be reading way too much into it, so you 
feel free to tell me if I am, but you mentioned like, like if somebody was to make it today, they, they might rely on technology too much and it might become like a Marvel movie. But every time I watched this movie and it was more apparent to me this time, and I think because you're dealing with a man with x-ray vision, right? This was made in 63 and this is, I mean, the 50s, that was like the time of George Reeves playing Superman on television. And if when you talk about, okay, I'm making a movie about a man who has x-ray vision, it sounds like a superhero movie. And it sounds like, I, and I don't know, I, w- I would think that audiences would have connected that specific type to like a Superman. But this goes in such a dark place compared to your superheroes of like the 50s and 60s. Do you think... I mean, I don't know, Mel, you've read more about, I think, the making of Corman's movies than I have, but I wonder if if he was at all influenced by, like, Superman and superheroes and was kind of giving us one of the first anti-superhero superhero stories, if that makes sense. Ooh, that's an interesting way of looking at it. I... I mean, I can't speak for him because, I mean, in in the interview that I stumbled upon, he says that part of the way he started the movie was thinking, oh, it'll be a scientist. But he said that was too obvious. So then he started, because he would often write like three or four, like really short blurb of a script that he would pass on to somebody else. So he talks about how he was like, oh, it'll be about a jazz musician who's taking too many drugs. And he's seeing these weird surrealistic things. And then he thinks, no, I don't like this. I'm going back to the scientist. So when he talks a little bit about like the influence of it, he talks about that. And the person who was interviewing him mentions that that same year, his movie, um, uh, was it The Haunted Palace came out that while it was included, um, in the post cycle was actually more Lovecraftian and was based on a Lovecraft story. So I felt like, but when I read that interview, I felt like the influences were more like anticipating maybe the surrealistic presentation of drug use in his later movies, but still having that Poe-esque horror and the mad scientist horror, but then also having a bit of Lovecraftian horror as well, which a lot of critics including Stephen King have noticed. But I definitely agree. Like the first thing I think of when I think of X-Ray and when I even started watching the movie, I even thought about Superman. I was watching the movie. Um, That's interesting to think of it as like an anti-superhero type thing because that's such the rage, I guess, now is to look at these superheroes in, in, in kind of opposite ways than we normally do. It's kind of like, if you have a superpower, do you use your powers for good or for evil? <laughs> and poor Xavier, like, starts out trying for good, maybe. <laughs> and then goes pretty far into the bad. <laughs> but no, that's an interesting way of looking at it. I mean, I wish I could be more definitive on what he thinks, but that's just what I what I read in the interview. Yeah, I just, I didn't know if you had read an interview where he talked about it at all. I mean, and mainly the thing... Because I, I I know he was trying not to be cliche in writing it. Because I had seen the interview too, where he was talking about the the writing of the script and how he can kind of flip flop between was it going to be a scientist or a different type of character who does this. So I know he was actively trying to avoid those cliches. So he it probably would have been somewhere back in his mind. But especially just the scene of the party where all the doctors are around, <laughs> which was kind of a funny scene. I, I like the way he 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 did the transition shot where you saw the syringe full of liquid and the doctor saying something like, we need so many CCs of this. And then you realize he's pouring liquor into, (laughs) into a mixed drink. And that's like the transition from the hospital into the party. Um, I, I just, just, I, I like that. But, um, when, but at that scene, you know, when he's looking at all the people in the party and, and then he, the gag is, is that he's seeing these beautiful women without their clothes on. I was like, well, that's directly a kind of Superman thing, you know, being able to see through walls or 
maybe even through the skirt of the pretty woman. So I don't know. That's just, I'm, I'm very curious to know if that was intentional or if he was just trying to make something different than had been done before. Um, but that is an interesting connection. I think Xavier and Superman kind of put up together. Well, and then he also goes by the name Mentallo when he <laughs> when he works at the carnival. That's almost like a weird um, <laughs> superhero type name, I guess. <laughs> That's a superficial connection. But I also thought of that when they were calling him Mentallo. I'm like, this is like a really like <laughs> this would be like a really low budget uh, superhero movie, right? <laughs> and like the bad guy is Mentallo. <laughs> It's a, it, it's like it's like the knockoff uh, X Men, you know. Yeah, <laughs> Doctor Xavier <laughs> becomes Mentallo. Mentallo. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if I if I as a professor was going to go become a, a carnival worker, I would try really hard to come up with a better name than Mentallo. But you know, maybe that was Don Rickles' character. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm putting that on Crane. <laughs> Well, while while he is Mentallo, <laughs> Bell, um, one of the really interesting things happens. I think if you're looking at X as the story of Doctor Xavier and kind of his, if this is a shape <laughs> and you see him, you see his hubris being his fatal flaw um, when he's looking at these people and healing them for money, Diane actually finds him. So the idea is that after he's been horrible to her and left her in Vegas, she is still so concerned with him and his well-being that she tracks him down, even though apparently he's taken measures so that he cannot be found, but she still found, finds him. And she comes in to see him as a patient except he doesn't recognize her and apparently the idea is that he says oh there's nothing wrong with you you're perfectly healthy and it's not until she starts talking that he realizes who she is and I thought that was really a touching moment because you see in his pursuit to kind of see what the gods see he is lost if not his humanity in its entirety he's at least lost his personal connection with other human beings. And that's shown in the relationship with Diane because at the beginning of the film, they were set up to be such equals and there was such mutual love and or maybe not love, but there was respect there for each other. And there was, I would say affection maybe would be a better word than love. And then now when you see them at the end of, of the story, he he has lost that. And that I thought was a really, it, for me, that's one of the most touching scenes is that he's gotten what he wants. I mean, he, he can see more than he's ever been able to see before, but he's now lost that connection to humanity. So even if he started wanting to care for patients, he's lost that ability to do that. And he certainly lost his ability to care and connect with Diane. Um, this, this is when this, the, the movie kind of goes a little crazy because they he starts to run off he won't let him leave i think this is actually where they go to the casino i might have gotten that flip-flopped a little bit when i was talking about my, my excitement um but after he, she comes to see him they escape they're gonna go get money um he drives off to the desert with the police chasing him. There's a helicopter involved. He crashes. It's, it, all, it all becomes very big, all quite um, quickly. <laughs> the, the, the police following him and the big police chase and everything. Um, but I love this part because he ends up rather unlikely in a kind of big tent revival. And there's a bunch of people in this tent listening to a preacher and, you know, they're all saying, singing hymns and yelling about loving the Lord. 
and about loving God. And then he comes running in with black eyes, looking like a demon out of Supernatural. <laughs> and starts screaming about what he can see. And in his mind, he's giving them what they want, right? Because he's telling them exactly what the center of the universe looks like. Like he's he's telling them this is what... This is what God looks like. This is what the universe looks like. This is there is this great seeing eye in the center of everything looking back at us. And they immediately turn on him and start calling him a sinner and saying that he is, you know, he he's involved in dark and evil things because he's saying these crazy things. And the preacher says a line from the book of Matthew, which is, if your eye offends you, then you should pluck it out, which, of course, thematically works perfectly with this whole movie uh, and works with that opening image. But they all start chanting, pluck it out, pluck it out, pluck it out. And then... In, in kind of the last great like twist reveal of of the movie he does it with i guess his own bare hands and you it ends with his kind of hollowed out bloody eye sockets <laughs> staring into the camera um and that's x uh <laughs> There was an apocryphal ending that I think we ought to mention before we run too long on this episode. Um, apparently in Dance Macabre, and I remember reading this, but Stephen King said that that, that there was another ending that was uh, never filmed, but was part of this movie, was that it after he plucks out his eye, he's supposed to say, I can still see, I can still see. And and that becomes really the horror of it is that he's been driven mad by being able to see the universe and what's in it. And so when he wants to end that madness, when he wants to end the chaos that's in his head, I guess, he realizes he can't because Every, he got everything he wanted and now he can't give it back. It's like, it's like the genie, right? You ask for a wish and, and it, you get it, but it's not what you wanted. Apparently Corman in an interview said that Stephen King wrote a better ending to the movie than he did, but that it wasn't a real ending that he had never intended to film him saying, I can still see. Um, but then I've also seen in other interviews where people have said that that was discussed, like a similar type ending was discussed, but that it was never filmed. So now it's just become part of like movie apocrypha, <laughs> this idea that that there might be an alternate ending to X. Um, I don't know. After reading everything with Corman, I think probably not, but I, I like that idea. Um, and And I think given the movie you could kind of imagine that he can still see i think some people have suggested that in the end credits of the movie when you get those kind of like swirling lights that that's actually supposed to be what he can still see um and so like he is actually being taken away by police maybe but i don't know i'm fine with the ending just being his hollowed bloodied eye sockets <laughs> Yeah, I'm fine with that ending too, but I do love that idea of him screaming, I can still see, like that, that that's almost like a poetic, like you said, kind of thing, but but the ending the way it is is still, I, my only quibble, and this is because it's from the 1960s, is that the shot of his eyes having been plucked out is like a split second and then it's the credits, like it should have lingered just a little bit longer, but they were probably trying not to run afoul of, you know, people that would keep them from actually being able to release the movie. <laughs> true. True. Well, and I think at that, at the point that they were making the movie, they didn't have a, a, a distributor at all. So that probably did play into it too. Corman's been very vocal about the fact that he wants his movies to sell and he wants them to make money. 
that's part of the reason he keeps his budget so low, but also part of the reason he knows what genre he's dealing with because he knows what, just what the audience wants. You know, he knows what to deliver to them. And I think you're probably right that if this had been made in say like the eighties or the nineties, it might've been a different movie, but because it was 63, he was only going to give you just enough that it wouldn't get pulled from theaters. Um, but yeah, I love that. I also love, because there's absolutely no reason for it to be a Big Tent revival at the end. And it's in the middle of the desert. I know. Like, there's no reason for, and he could have, he could have just stood there in the desert while the police were coming in and like had his breakdown and torn out his eyes. But just the fact that Corman felt the need to like <laughs> have a bunch of like religious <laughs> I mean, fanatics, I guess, would be a good word, but, like, yelling, pluck it out. Uh, I I don't know. It just, it's, it's bonkers, but it tickles me, and I love it. I felt like it was kind of, I don't know, maybe appropriate, because you have this man who's lived his whole life in all the science, but he wants to see what the gods see. He wants to be more than a human he he wants to be something superior and then he stumbles uh, through his experiment he stumbles upon this possible lovecraftian elder god of some sort the eye in the center of the universe which is such a creepy surreal scene when it shows it and it's not only that he looks at the center of the universe and sees that there's something there he looks at the center of the universe and the center of the universe looks back at him and he's aware that it's aware of him which is quite terrifying and and dark when you think about it because what does that then mean for humanity and so you have all these weird levels of madness from science to blind faith to the horror of the lack of meaning in the universe or maybe the meaning that you don't want. And then it's all happening in a big tent revival with these, like you said, fanatics who are kind of, I mean, depending on your take, kind of mad. I mean, they want him to pluck his eyeballs out. They don't seem to understand metaphor. Um, (laughs) And there's like all this (laughs) happening in this, this big kind of explosion of an ending. I don't know. I thought it kind of dovetailed really well to do it that way. No, it does. It does. Well, that's why I said this is, you could look at this as like sci-fi horror, like schlocky 60s sci-fi, but then you could also look at this as like a, a freaking Shakespeare play, <laughs> the way everything comes together. Because, I mean, e- even in their own way, if you look at the people at that Big Tent revival who don't understand metaphor, um, <laughs> just looking at it from their point of view, they have a man who is literally walking in and telling them exactly what they want to know. Like he is telling them what is out there. And that is their reaction is to say, pluck out your eye because it's offending you. And to basically, I mean, they're basically calling him a, in calling him a sinner. They're calling him a liar. Uh, I don't know. I just, I love it. <laughs> yeah, because what he's saying is actually there. Yeah, like you're saying, it doesn't, it doesn't jive with their, it doesn't jive with their, um, their philosophy. So they're just like, they're just going to use the text of the philosophy that they know. And it's like, well, if you're saying something we disagree with, then you need to pluck your eyeballs out. Um, and yeah, I mean, to him, he's, which, I mean, I guess at this point, he's gone beyond the point of return if his eyeballs are turning black. Um, I'm not sure that he could stop using the drops and go back. It's almost like, yeah, I've gone beyond the point of no return. My eyes are the problem. So if I pull them out, maybe it'll stop. But uh, I mean, you have that pretentious note right before he accidentally kills his friend, Sam, the eye doctor, when when Sam says, you know, I think we need to slow down and do some more research because the eyes are attached directly to the brain. And he's like, I don't care. And, and I think that end (laughs) shows that if you do read it as he pulls the eyes out to stop this from happening, maybe his malady continues because we don't know how, if the, if the drops have done what they've done to his eyes and what the heck are they doing to his brain? Because his brain is what's interpreting what he's saying. So I mean, I don't want to get to like actual science in a movie that's not actual science, <laughs> but I do think there's just, there's just so many layers to what's going on at the end and how all these different 
how these different systems or whatever are are bumping up against each other or ways of interpretation well either way i mean because i could sit here and and talk about you know all, all the the fun stuff i love about this movie um either way it's just it's a fun movie to watch i think if you enjoy the kind of 60 sci-fi mashed with horror or if, if you like cosmic horror is your thing i think x is a is a really fun movie to watch and it is it is available streaming so it's easy to find and you know we've watched some older movies that the quality has not been so great and i think this is one that holds up um i mean it's obviously a movie of its time uh but i i do think it holds up it's 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 fun it's creepy it's uh, it, it's it's a good movie and it's probably better than it needs to be in a lot of ways and i like it so i still stand by it every time i watch it i like it more and more and I'm I'm very glad that Matt, you got to watch it again, and Mel, you got to experience <laughs> experience this movie for the first time. Um, hopefully, we will watch more Corman uh, in the future. And hopefully, now that I realize we have not done a Ray Russell Master of Horror, we might tackle that soon. But I guess we'll just have to wait and see. Well, this is just a reminder that your co-host Lisa and Mel wrote a nonfiction book about the women who have written horror and dark speculative fiction. Uh, so if you, that sounds up your alley, uh, Monster She Wrote is available through the Quirk Books website or any major book retailer. As always, we'd love to hear from you, especially if you want to tell me how much you love X. We're at No Fear Cast on Twitter and Instagram, and we have a Facebook page. If you'd like to contact us by email, you can do that at nofearcast at gmail.com. If you love what we're doing, consider supporting us on Patreon. So you'll get exclusive, uh, you'll get exclusive access to content that is not available to everybody else. You can also just rate and review us or tell a friend, which is entirely free and helps other listeners find us. Once again, thanks for listening, and we will be back in two weeks with a brand new episode.